Hello and welcome to the Undisciplined Podcast. Today we're talking to Associate Professor Thomas Nail of the University of Denver on his work on Kenner politics. It's a great discussion. We talk about many of his different books, Theory of the Border, Being in Motion, Theory of the Image, all published by Oxford University Press. I'm sure you will enjoy it. We also touch upon the current coronavirus pandemic. I hope wherever you are, you're doing well and that you're safe. And even if you're healthy, I hope this podcast gives you at least one hour of uh, relief from whatever situation you're finding yourself in. The intro music is made by Greta. The track is called Tranquillitatis. There's a link in the description to his page. Please check it out. Enjoy the episode with Professor Nail. Let's go. How are you today? Great. Thanks. Great. How are you? Everything is I'm good, thanks. Everything is okay on your side regarding the the global pandemic that we have right now? Yeah, I'm doing as well as 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 I could imagine. Um I don't really have any room to complain given what the rest of the world is going through. I think uh I'm I'm I, I'm I have no right to complain about anything right now. <laughs> Well, I hope uh, I hope it stays that way. So, um, Professor Nail, before we get into your very very interesting work in philosophy, we usually start with a short biographical sketch of your academic background. What brought you to philosophy, and what got you interested in specifically in the topics interested in and that you're writing about? Um, do you mind? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Um, I will try to, I feel like I've told this story before and it's gone quite long. So I'm going to tell you a very shorter version of it, which is that I got into philosophy through, uh, punk rock music and active political activism. And I remember listening to the, uh, the Canadian punk band Propagandi and, uh, their lyrics are very political, uh, very smart uh satirical and they're referencing noam chomsky a lot it's like who is mm -hmm. noam chomsky i mean i was just like a you know a teenager and um you know reading noam chomsky and then sort of becoming politicized uh through punk music and then trying to figure out what what that what what political theory was all about what's what's behind it and um that got me into basically doing political theory um and i did that through undergrad and into graduate school doing feminist philosophy and environmental philosophy and being interested in uh, anarchism. And then in graduate school, I'm skipping lots of things here, but uh, toward the end of graduate school, um, I became interested in migration. And mm -hmm. that was, I felt it was a topic that political theorists hadn't dealt with as much as I would like to see. There was bits here and there, of course. Um, Agamben says a few things that were very influential to me. Uh, Alain Badiou spent quite a number of years uh, working as an activist uh, with the Saint Papier in France, which was inspiring. Um, uh, Etienne Balibar writes about the Saint Papier and Ranciere, and so, but you know, just sort of here and there, no major works or theories, and uh, and certainly in the liberal tradition, very little was said about migration or borders. Uh, they were in a if you follow the Rawlsian tradition, Rawls is just, he's got nothing to say about borders and migration, you know, in the ideal state, um, <laughs> there's just, nobody would want to leave. So it's just not really a relevant issue for him. Uh, mm -hmm. anyway, so this was around 2010. I did a Fulbright scholarship, uh, to Canada, um, because I wanted to work with this group called no one is illegal, um, which is a migrant justice group, um, in Toronto. And so I spent a little bit of time in Montreal and then I spent most of the year of 2010 in working with this group in Toronto. And that was a really great experience because I sort of just got to do uh, my passions, which was read political theory and do political activism and, you know, be paid to do that. So not a lot, but uh, I still was able to survive and do it. And so that's what um, I felt that there was a lack in the scholarship. Uh, in political theory on migration. And so I went to go 
to work with these activists, who was definitely by far one of the most interesting and rewarding uh, activist experiences that I've had, um, and came back and was inspired to write something um, about it. And so The Figure of the Migrant was the book that came out of that as a response to uh, the literatures that didn't really answer the questions that I had, didn't take the question of migration quite as seriously and as radically as I wanted to take it. And so that that kind of sparked that interest in migration. And from there, in writing The Figure of the Migrant, I was researching all this stuff about movement and mobility and migration, reading geographers and you know citizen ship scholars and border theorists and all the all bunch of different disciplines and doing the historical work tracking migration far back uh historically speaking i began to see some interesting connections which is the connections of the subordination of people regarding their movement and then other areas of society that i hadn't anticipated originally like in aesthetics um, in science and in uh, philosophy and ontology specifically, that motion was this interesting category, this kind of, you know, uh, denigrated bottom of the great chain of being category that explained a lot of things that I hadn't uh, really anticipated. But then I started tracking all those. And then so the mm-hmm. series of books that I've been writing after this have all come out of this experience of, of of working with migrants and writing about migration and then seeing that it's not just an issue of migration. It's a larger historical issue of subordinating motion and privileging stasis. Um, Mm. And so kind of tracking that history has, I've been very occupied (laughs) with that um, and writing, writing quite a bit. Immediately from your story, there's a burning question that I have to ask you. So, which do you think is better? How to clean everything or today's empires and tomorrow's ashes? <laughs> oh, that's really tough because actually those are, I think, two of my favorite albums. How to Clean Everything is just, that's the album that got me into propaganda. And so like it always has a place for me. And then today's empires, tomorrow's ashes is just like they're fully mature, you know, uh, they're fully mature expression of what they've been doing for a decade. Oh, that's really tough. I can't say. I no, can't say. I just like them for different reasons. Um, you don't yeah, have to I'm... really choose. <laughs> we, you can like both of them. Yeah, I like them both for totally different reasons. Like the early one is like they're just like young and pissed off, and the lyrics are like smart and sort of sophisticated, but also filled with like just swear words. Uh, right. And then to, yeah, today's empires, tomorrow's ashes. But then yeah, I maybe I might lean towards today's empires just because um todd the rod is the basis um yeah whose bands i've really liked before he was in propaganda um i spy and swallowing shit uh, are the two mm. other bands that he was in before then and then the combination was just like perfect like it just took two of my favorite bands and brought them together um for that album anyway yeah no i'm just <laughs> I'm very thrilled to hear you mentioned propaganda by name because it's in my research and also in my everyday life we read all these thick and sometimes difficult books, but at the end of the day, most of my inspiration and actually most of my motivation still comes from uh, just a handful of bands and albums and propaganda <laughs> is really central for that. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to hear the same from someone else. I think they've done more for, for political thinking than maybe some academics have done. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, that's, that's, really, that's really cool. You have the same experience. It's always nice to meet yeah. other academics who are also punks. And there is, I, I, I'm collecting these people because I, I, I feel that there's something about that a generation of, of punk music that really radicalized a lot of people who ended up becoming academics because there was just no other, it was like, there's no other way out of like, what are you going to do with your life to like somehow make a living and not give in, you know, to the capitalist system in a, in a, in just a, in a more complete way so yeah for sure yeah i totally relate to that yeah but so to get a little bit more serious again so it's interesting to me that in your story you came to this idea of movement or rather i assume that you started from movement and then kind of shot out in different directions looking how it's applied but now it's interesting to me that you 
you came to it from an opposite direction that you started with migration and the problems associated with that and then you saw like the deeper root of of the issue there so so actually you don't start with the theory or the philosophy but you really started from practice right yeah that's i mean that's a really important part of my work in general and i think something that's really important for philosophers and philosophy and really academics to keep in mind uh more broadly is that theory you don't just start with theories you know like that's whatever that's like 19th century that's like history of philosophy it's like you know descartes gonna mm-hmm. go to his cabin and like contemplate some wax melting in isolation i mean it's yeah. just nonsense you know like there is a world out there and philosophy is responsible to, you know, to respond to those problems. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, whatever, obviously from my story, that's my orientation is through, uh, through activism and politics has always been my starting point. Um, thinking about Zapatismo and thinking about migration, like to look where really important historical conflicts are happening and think about what those mean, you know, more broadly. Mm -hmm. And so, uh that so starting with migration sort of led me to see the connections and then from there it led me to then go back to the question of history again and think more uh about climate change um and about Mm -hmm. uh, quantum physics and about digital media as being kind of 21st century uh or at least late 20th uh century and transitionary really big historical moments that that are connected with migration. So migration was the starting point, but then I realized that migration was part of a much larger historical moment that should cause us to, in the same way that migration took me back to see motion as being a constitutive part of, of Western history. The same Mm -hmm. thing is true of, of climate change and, uh, and issues in quantum physics and, you know, contemporary digital media. To get a little bit theoretical now. So you place this emphasis on motion, which I think is quite novel because, you know, usually in, in the history of philosophy, we tr- try to interpret the world through the axes of uh, time on the one hand and space on the other hand. And then we have seen some attempts at reconciling these two or combining them into something like being would be probably the most famous example. So on the one hand, I'm totally with you that motion is a very elegant way of combining space and time as the movement of something but why do we need a different category from something like being for example yeah that's it's a good question the first the first two things that i would say is that you know there's um there's maybe like a weak answer to this and then there's just like the more the stronger answer and i'll give you the weaker one first which is that it would be worth doing a project that focused on the history of motion, the philosophical mm-hmm. and political and aesthetic history of motion, just because nobody's done it. Like it would just be, that's the weak, the weak thing to say, the weak argument is just, mm-hmm. um, it would be novel just to do it because nobody's done it. And then be, in, and it's interesting to ask why no one's done it. What is it about motion that has let not, not have the same kind of reception and interest and scholarship as space and, and space and time. Mm. Um, so I think it's worth doing just on its own for, for, for curiosity reasons, but you know, that's not where I'm coming from. Um, my motivation, the stronger motivation is that there's something about the historical present, um, that, that, that resonates very deeply with thinking about movement and mobility. Um, and those are the examples I won't go into too many details unless you want to talk about it, but I mean, global migration, maybe that speaks for itself. Um, but climate change and uh, and and certain science, scientific discoveries and digital media too, for me, are very big events that make us that really want us to think about movement and mobility, um, and want us to think about uh, the history uh, that we haven't really paid attention to, the history of movement and motion. And now the second thing that I'll say is about the question of bridge, you know, sort of mm-hmm. combining space and time. It's tricky because the philosophy of time is, is different in different time periods. So there's not really a philosophy of time. And really, mm. you know, the whole ancient world, time is not really a central uh, philosophical category. Eternity, you know, is what's in, is important there. Something that doesn't move, that doesn't change, that Archimedean point, the unmoved mover, something 
that grounds the rest of being in something that doesn't move is very important. Uh, and time is just a secondary thing. I mean, Aristotle, mm. pretty much all the ancients said that motion was just, or excuse me, that time is just the measure of motion. So they didn't, they think that thought time was just, mm. you know, motion is what is, is moving around, of course, where it's really fundamental mm -hmm. is stasis. And then things move around the periphery and then time measures those motions with units, hours, mm -hmm. minutes, whatever. And then it's not till Kant that time becomes more foundational than eternity, than movement, than space. Time is that inner sense. And so time becomes, and then at post, yeah. post Kantian philosophy is for that reason, all about time and hence Heidegger's being in time <laughs> um, is quite important. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say that time and space are very important, but I would also want to throw in there eternity uh, in the ancient period. And I would put uh, something like force. There's like a, over 30 different words historically over mm -hmm. the medieval period to describe uh, vital forces. You have the history of vitalism, you have energies, uh, inertia, uh, endeavor, conatus, all these words that try to get at something more primary, some kind of dynamic uh, force that's moving everything. And so motion is really different than all those categories. And then the, the last thing I'll say is that I'm not sure that I was like, I wasn't thinking about motion as being a contestation uh, or like a different, different than being, but more that mm -hmm. it's maybe being and motion. I guess I didn't mean those to be two separate things, but being as motion. So being always takes on a historical character. Like I'm, I, I, my position is not a metaphysical one. Like I don't think being is motion period, full stop. I just claimed it cause I'm some philosopher like i don't think that at all i really think that it's just a historical perspective on being and being has multiple historical perspectives because it is being is historical and so if being is historical then it's going to appear and manifest differently at different historical times and epochs and so on and so motion is just the one that i think best characterize i mean best whatever not best in any absolute sense but just in the historical mm -hmm. sense that um this is where we're at now and who knows what it will be in the future. Mm. So it's not any absolute, a historical claim, um, that being is motion now. Yeah. Thank you. This question, I don't want to make it too broad. Otherwise th that would be a whole book on itself just to answer that. But let's say when you started looking, try to look through the glasses of motion at, at the world and you said, that it hadn't really been done before. So if we first begin to look at the world through motion, what are some of the first things that were previously obscured that suddenly, at least then for you, when you started this project, what were some of the things that quickly sprang up for the first time that became very obvious to you that you didn't mm, expect? Yeah. So I, I would say that just to qualify very quickly, I don't think that it's not like nobody has ever talked about motion because frankly, everybody has talked about motion. There's like, there's not a philosopher or theorist or anybody who hasn't said something about motion. The difference is whether mm. motion is ontologically primary, whether that's the starting point of analysis or whether that's a secondary mm. or derivative feature. And I think almost everybody in the history of Western thought, at least has motion has been a secondary uh, thing, something that happens to what is already primary, some substance or eternal form or vital force or temporal, you know, a priori or whatever. But so to answer your question, I think the thing that some of the first things that I found to be very uh, shocking when I started looking at this was one that it's not just that movement was a subordinated term, it's that the movement was actually the primary uh, ordering structure that, that, that things were first that that matter is moving around and that all these other things get built mm -hmm. on top of it. So the interesting question to me, which has taken up a lot of years of trying to get the answer to it, is if, if being really is in motion, then how could we have missed this for so long? Like what are the techniques and tools mm -hmm. and like how do we perpetuate uh, a, a, a other perspectives that cover over that that movement like you know what are the techniques of explanation that obscure mm. uh the movement uh, of, of matter and make it and and convince us that it's not actually important or primary 
And that has all kinds of, that has different answers in aesthetics, in politics, um, in ontology and so on. And so one of the answers with respect to like, I suppose we could answer any of these, I'll just answer one and, you know, leave the rest. But uh, with respect to ontology, it actually has to do with the material techniques mm. of doing, of doing it, of writing. Like, no, we don't know what anybody thought. We always say so-and-so thought this, so-and-so thought that. We have absolutely no, we don't, we're not, we don't have access to anybody's thoughts. What we have access to are real histor are, are the residues of historical practices, material cultures and writings and texts and all kinds of stuff. But we don't actually have access to thoughts of dead people. Of the of, of what people have thought in mm. history, so the challenge, at least in the in being in motion, was to go back and say, what are the material techniques? So, for example, writing, uh, books, printing press, typewriters. Um, what are the what are the material techniques that like, and how what's their structure of motion? Like, what is the the form of motion that covers over the fact that they're using a material motion in order to generate? some thought of the ideal, of the abstract, of the universal, of time, of space, of whatever, what are they really doing? So there's a kind of media archaeology that goes along with that from a materialist uh, perspective. And the second thing that, I mean, this is maybe the major thing that I found, I suppose, is these patterns, which matches up with a bit of uh, sort of systems theory. Um, but for me, I mean, I like systems mm -hmm. theory, but what I was, but my orientation is much more, I suppose, kinetic, which is that the systems are systems of motion, patterns of motion. So centripetal, centrifugal, tensional, and elastic. These are in, you know, I mean, the, these are the, these are the major patterns of motion in physics uh, that you can kind of understand all different movements in, in these different, uh, these different ways. Obviously there's subtypes and combinations and hybrids, but these are the kind mm. of patterns I was like, oh, wait, there are all these patterns going on in each of these different historical periods. These patterns take on a kind of dominance. They're, all of them are always happening, but in some time periods, one of them really takes hold and becomes a guiding structure. And that happens, that's like, it's, it's across disciplines. It doesn't have to do with just politics or ontology. It's, it's historical. Like It's really the way that matter moved and circulated in a given time. So that's to me, those four types of motion uh, were really, really uh, an important discovery, and I'm mm. I'm very curious to see how people will respond to those. I'm it's an empirical kind of argument, so I'm open to being wrong about those patterns. But it was quite a discovery. Well, I'm personally coming from the field of international law, very interested in my own work on borders. And you wrote a wonderful book on borders that was uh, quite a discovery for me too. It was so different from all the other literature that's out there that I read about borders. And I want to talk about that book a little bit. So what is the reason when you're looking at movement and studying movement, how did you end up hitting the concept of the border? from movement and what was interesting for you about how borders function because you you also turn a lot of the kind of traditional assumptions about borders upside down so what drew you to the border in the first place and how would you say does it fit within your bigger project of looking at movement or kinopolitics um i'm glad you like the book thanks um the thing that got me into i liked it a lot <laughs> <laughs> the thing that got me into borders was starting with, like I said, working with uh, No One Is Illegal in Toronto and thinking about migration. And really that project in my mind, it was really one book, The Migrant and the Borders, but together they would have been over 600 pages or something. So it was too big. Mm. Uh, so really both of those were related. That's, you know, those are the two political, uh, like major kind of political ways of thinking about you know, politics and motion was uh, thinking about migration and borders at the same time as part of the same uh, regimes of circulation, like how, what are the historical patterns of that, that people have circulated in and how have those patterns been controlled? So that's how I started with that. Um, but I wrote the migrant book first and then wrote the border book, but they were very much, the, the research was all happening at the same time. Um, and then they just got separately written the main discovery for me in that borders book was so so the premise the kind of main thesis of the figure of the migrant is that what if we went back and instead of thinking about migration as this secondary derivative thing that kind of 
you know, there's states and then people move between those states. Uh, what if we went back and looked at migration and saw the figure of the migrant as actually a primary political figure that mm-hmm. produced uh, and made possible, whose circulation and exploitation made possible the states in the first place, um, then it's not like migrants move between states. It's that states are metastable systems composed of migrants that are circulating uh, in these kind of patterns. Um, and so that perspective is that's the migrant. And then the, the perspective of the border is very similar, is to take movement as primary. So we often think about borders as being secondary, like, oh, first there's states and then states build borders uh, mm-hmm. to protect themselves or keep people in or keep people out or whatever. So the border there is secondary. So what movement is a, like an afterthought of the primary task of sovereignty or something like that. So there's a lot of analysis on sovereignty and states of exception and inclusion and exclusion. And so I wanted to sort of think about movement as being a primary factor, think about borders and migrants being the primary uh, constitutive activities of politics, just broadly from the Neolithic to the present, that borders have been what come first. And so I've tried to track that and show it historically that before there were states, and maybe this is just obvious, before there were any states, there were borders. Borders Mm -hmm. meaning any kind of structure that directed movement, human movement and natural movement. And so those those bordering techniques are most certainly what come first. And states only exist because they're borders. And I'll just give one example of that, which is um, in the ancient uh, world in the Near East and uh, West, you just, if you wanted to have a city without a wall, then you're, mm-hmm. your city's not going to last. Own cities, literally what the city means uh, etymologically in the Proto-Indo-European language is like a walled citadel. The wall is a really constitutive part of what it means to have a city, which is to say civilization, uh, etymologically speaking. Um, To have that state, to have that city, you need that wall or else you'll be raided. And then there's this whole, you know, back and forth of the technologies of wall building and the first cities to start baking bricks to build Mm. really strong walls were the cities that could emerge first and maintain uh, maintain themselves. So building storage units around grain and then building giant walls around those groups of people, around those grain silos, it's the foundation of civilization and states and cities and all that stuff. Um, so it's really, really a constitutive. Uh, borders are constitutive. And that's how I started thinking about those historically mm-hmm. and then leading all the way up to the present to see how borders are really very active in the, in their own right. And they're not really, they're less about including and excluding people and more sort of about circulating and directing motion. Because it's not like anybody gets to a border and is told no, and then just never moves again. Of course, they move afterwards. They will set up camps nearby borders. Uh, they will sneak over borders. Uh, they will return or move on to other places because they couldn't pass the board like all kinds of effects happen that if you just Mm -hmm. said oh people are excluded it just leave you're 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 not you're not looking at what happens after that and so inclusion and exclusion it's just to me it's not a very helpful theoretical category it'd be more interesting and is more interesting to look at the patterns of circulation that are changed of animals of people of water Uh, of land, of all kinds of things that happen as borders sort of shift and redistribute um, and kind of bifurcate things as opposed to blocking them. Right. I think maybe one way of saying that would be that if we think of the inclusion-exclusion dynamic, that would think that we'd be thinking about borders perhaps in terms of place, but not really in time. It's only focusing on a very single moment in time and not thinking about what happened before or what happened after, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So just one thing that I was wondering when I was reading the book and now that you're talking about your examples from uh, ancient civilizations, uh, a very mundane practical question, but how did you do this research? If your background is in philosophy, you must have read so widely. Uh, and I was really impressed in the book by the, the breadth of uh of knowledge that that you display in the book was there it's not daunting for you reading i don't know archaeological research for example things like that yeah there was definitely a period of time so uh, you know i did my training in a philosophy department and i was very well trained to read philosophers and texts 
And that was all great. Um, but when it came to doing, you know, field work and activist work and working with activists and then doing research that was historical was really, it was like, it was just like starting a new PhD or something, you know, mm. it was like trying to then go back through those literatures, those other disciplines, figure out their language. I mean, I did, I read a ton of stuff and very little of it, you know, was philosophy. And so that, that shapes the character of what that is. One of my methodological inspirations, especially during the figure of the migrant and theory of the border was Foucault. Um, and, you know, Foucault has that kind of you know, that kind of breadth, like he's working with an archive of a lot of different, uh, a lot of different authors, and he's kind of citing people across these different disciplines. Um, and historically, we don't have the same kind, there's not the same kinds of divisions in disciplines as there are now. Mm -hmm. So that pushes you a little bit more. It was all very good. It was all very healthy and exciting, but it was a hell of a lot of work. But that was, I, at that point, I think I was sort of bored of reading Deleuze, <laughs> you know, because I had written my dissertation on Deleuze and uh, my first book. On I Deleuze can imagine and I take my hat off to you. So I also want to move on to some of your other work, but still within this broader theme. So your, I believe it's your newest book called Theory of the Image. You do a philosophy of art or aesthetics that naturally focuses on the mobile aspect of images, which is something that I'd never mm -hmm. thought of before. So kind of like my first earlier question about what does mobility or movement reveal? So more specifically this time, in the specific case of the image, what avenue is opened up to us or what point of view is opened up to us when we look at the image as a moving image? Yeah, so the theory of the image book was yeah that research was also came out of the migration and border stuff i was already kind of collecting little bits from history uh, toward that book um because i started to see some of the same same problems which is that uh there are kind of two main ways of thinking about aesthetics and what an image is um one of those is maybe you could say the kind of classical model where, you know, if you think of Plato, you have the forms and then what art does is art represents the forms. So it's a copy mm. of an original. Mm. And that's what an image is, is it's supposed to be a kind of duplicate, but the duplicate is always inferior to the original, uh, to the original model for Plato. And that's why philosophical knowledge is about the forms and art and aesthetics are you're just in a cave looking at shadows. Um, and so there's a really clear when you Think about the great chain of being, being uh, and uh, stasis and form are on the top of that and matter and motion are on the bottom. And that's certainly what's going on uh, in Plato. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, you have the other major tradition you have is the kind of Kantian one, which is where the image um, and sensation is sort of understood hermeneutically or by, you know, what does it mean for humans? Like, what does art mean? What is the meaning of art? What is the experience of the work of art? In you have more, and that's maybe sort of Kant and Dewey. And then you have more social dimensions of that, which are, you know, uh, Frankfurt School and so on, kind of more social uh, hermeneutics that have to do with like what the meaning of a work of art is for, what does it tell us about society? Mm -hmm. On that one, my problem is, is that we're still really in both of these cases in the kind of Plato version of the classical and then the more modern one, we're not really talking about the image. We're not really talking about art. What we're talking about is the forms, which are more important. That's the real thing that we care about. And then in the case of the human version, we're really, we're interested in what humans think. Uh, and we're really studying ourselves more than we're actually caring about, you know, the image itself. Um, so my orientation in theory of the image was to do basically what I did for theory of the border and figure of the migrant, which was to sort of flip, flip it upside down and start with the mobility and movement of the image and just kind of track, track it, um, from a, you know, a kind of kinetic systems approach, um, and think about the patterns of motion that the image move, like just what it does. So instead of thinking about what art means, uh, or what it represents, uh, just look at, at what it does, um, at what it does materially, practically, historically, and then look at these different regimes of the way in which art and images are shaped and circulated, not how they're represented or what their meanings are or whatever. So it's a very different approach to thinking about aesthetics that's uh, materialist mm -hmm. um, and that is non-anthropocentric. It's not 
you know, it doesn't focus on human interpretation of art. Um, and that's mostly what art theory is about. So this is a very weird book to think about if we're not interested in what humans are, you know, what they think art means or what it makes them feel or something. I mean, not that those are not relevant. It's just, that's not the primary focus. Those are part. It's a different problem, right? Yeah. So human experience is part of a larger circulation, right. but that larger circulation is what we're looking at. And then humans are one, they are also aesthetic uh, in their own way and they have sensations, but that's just one aspect of a larger, of a larger process. So I'm wondering if you talk about getting rid of the anthropocentrism and the movement and the real effect that art or images have. And also in the same way that we're talking about the border as a, almost a concrete thing. Do you see any uh, relation between kinopolitics and something like, for example, object oriented ontology? Or do you think there are important differences that you would like to keep some distinctions that you would want to keep between the two? Where do you think that th th there's some overlap or link there between between these two? Yeah, so this is a, it's, it's a good question. So I'm just going to give my definition of what I think object oriented ontology is, mm -hmm. um, and then say what I think the differences are. Object oriented ontology is looking at objects. And what an object is, is something that is um, and here I'm just I'm just reading Graham Harmon's definition. It is something that is discrete. Um, he describes it, them as a vacuum sealed. They are separate from one another. And so Tristan Garcia's book, Form an Object, has a very similar definition, where the objects are completely extensive. Like they're by definition, they are not what the other object is. Um, there are objects that contain, and then objects that are contained, and that's the difference. That what's, that's what defines an object. So they're discrete, they're vacuum sealed, and at the center of them has an essence, which Harmon says does not change, it does not move, it is not material, and it withdraws any attempt to empirically identify it. And so the difference, uh, so whether that's right or wrong, that's at least my understanding of what that tradition is doing. Uh, the philosophy of movement is really about process. It's not about objects as primary. Mm -hmm. So it's in many ways, it's sort of the philosophy of movement is the opposite of object-oriented ontology, where it doesn't start with discrete separate objects. It's, um, it starts with processes. Um, and it starts with that objects are, for me, metastable states, you know, like a whirlpool or an eddy or something like that. They're there, but they're just, they don't have any discreteness um, and they don't have any isolation. Mm -hmm. um, Graham Harmon is very, emphasizes very strongly that the essence of the object is non-relational. It doesn't relate uh, to anything else. And for me, that's, that's very much the opposite, where uh, for me, objects are metastable states that are It's not that there are relations before there are objects. It's that relations and objects are completely imminent to one another. They're not separate. They're just two different ways of talking about the same thing. And of course, the static, the unchanging, withdrawn essence to me is is just that's that's metaphysics. And um, mm -hmm. I, uh, the philosophy of movement is a materialist philosophy um, that's interested in thinking about uh, things that move and matter. That's the thing about matter is it's. It's a shape changer. It's always moving and changing shapes. Um, and so there's nothing that withdraws. There's nothing that like infinitely withdraws. Nothing that doesn't change. Everything is in, mo is in motion and movement. And on that point, it's, you know, I'm not, this is not a metaphysical claim. This is just where we're at. This is what, uh, this is, this is what we know in physics at this point in history is that there is nothing in the universe that doesn't move. And so stasis is not a real It's not a real thing. It's always relative. Down to quantum field fluctuations, they are moving and they're active. Nothing is a static withdrawn essence. And so I just, I don't, it, Harman, object oriented ontology is not consistent with what we know in physics. Um, and so, you know, maybe physics could be wrong and I'm open to that. But for the moment, I'm not going to speculate metaphysically about things that we have no idea about. Right. Oh, that, thank you. That's very clear. That, because I, I, I thought I felt some kind of overlap, but now that you explain it, <laughs> I can clearly see the difference. So still talking about the theory of the image, I want to ask 
a very selfish personal question. I'm particularly interested in maps and how maps have led to creating borders and how they've led to creating nation states and all the legal effects that borders have on, for example, migrants. And one of the things that in my own thinking has been quite important is the idea of the map not as just the abstract way of triangulating the world, but it's the map is a really physical object, something that you can put either in your hands or have it on your table and move your finger across and you can look at the whole world at the same time and mm -hmm. you can right. scratch on it with a pen, draw a line with a pen. That very material and, and mobile aspect of maps has always felt very significant to me. So I'm being very selfish and asking your opinion on how do you think the the map, the world map or the national map, how that fits in with kinopolitics and borders and moving images. Yeah, that's such a rich, such a rich topic. I so I think it would be an incredible project. I I have not um, I have not written about that extensively, but I will say that I've thought a lot about uh, technology and mobility, um, because to me, technology is very much about mobility. And I'll just give a couple examples that relate to maps, historically mm -hmm. speaking, like what technologies have a tendency, not that they always end up doing it, but a tendency to uh, dissipate, you know, kind of thermodynamically, like they, they want to spread, they want to move around, and they want to reproduce, you know, maybe this is sounding Simone Doan like here, but yeah. you know, there is this kind of agency of technologies that is not reducible to just what humans want to do with them, but they have this way of of mobilizing and spreading themselves and reproducing. And so when you think about a number of technologies and maps would be included, but I'll just give one example about uh, writing and written text, which include maps. Historically, the the transition from vellum uh, written on animal animal skin books to paper books one of the really, like, if you just look at the evolution of the structure of the book, which includes books with maps, and also maps themselves moving from vellum to paper, that transition is very important, because it has all these geopolitical consequences of simply changing the materiality. Uh, you can now move a lot because paper is lighter, you can move and circuit, you can reproduce it uh, easier, faster and mobilize it. And those are the two things that, uh, you know, the, the, the structure of empires historically of civilizations and empires relies on the mobility of maps and documents yeah. and that the importance of those things for them to spread and be lightweight and flexible and mobile is just, it's part of, it's not, I mean, it's part of how that technology has developed very much related to the the development of Western uh, history, mm -hmm. which has been uh, dominated by states and and empires and so on, that have put these technologies to their service, uh, they've shaped. You know, they, they've had that very particular history that they have had, and I think maps are most certainly part of that history. But maps are really especially interesting because they're sort of these like special documents, these special papers that whose mobility is actually. Uh, in the service of increasing the mobility mm. of the other types of technology, you know, maps have very much served the interests of empires and sovereigns and conquerors and colonialism and, you know, compasses and maps without compasses and maps, you know, it's hard to imagine a history of, of Western colonialism without his, without compasses and maps. Just that 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 tech. Yeah, it's definitely essential. Yeah. It's so essential, and it's it's crazy to think so much of history would pivot on such what we think are very simple technologies. But those technologies are there; they are themselves mobile, and the fact that they are mobile, that you can take them on a boat out into the ocean, is is crucial. And with that, you really get yeah the history of empire and colonization, um, and you get also the making of more maps, which then themselves expand the empire itself so like they're mobile technologies that increase the mobility of the empire which makes it possible for more uh technologies to become increasingly mobile and expand i think in your work you 
you know, the topics that you deal with are very political and all of them have political implications. You know, borders naturally, uh, migrants that go with that, of course. And you also talk about image and what images do. But would you say that your work falls under a greater a political project or is it for you a philosophical project? Definitely both. I would say that some of it, a lot of the historical work is in the service of, you know, I think often in this case about uh, the way that, you know, Foucault, it's like when you read Foucault's, like if you read um, Discipline and Punish, you would, it's very kind of historical and it's interesting and it feels kind of academic. And then if you look at what he was doing, you know, the prison information group and, you know, some of the interviews, he's very clear. He's all about you know, abolishing uh, the prisons. Uh, he makes these claims in, in this one interview about abolishing the state. It's a very radical political uh, project. Mm -hmm. And then the way that it finds this kind of, you know, historical expression and discipline and punish, reading reading the two Foucaults, the Foucault of his interviews and the Foucault of his monographs is a really different, uh, they're really different kinds of projects and what he wants to say and do in each of them is quite different. And I would say maybe something similar about my own work, um, but I, you know, I'm very clear about what I think some of the consequences of the figure, the my, the political works especially are. One of those, because it comes out of of, of an activist group specifically that I I, I feel very much uh, sympathy for 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 their claims and causes, and that is uh, really a radical position about the the abolition of status. You know, one of their main claims is status for all, which is a very strange thing because if stat if everybody had status, status kind of loses its meaning at a certain point if everyone has it. Mm -hmm. um, but that is very much to me a positive, uh, a, a possible and desirable future is having a much more reduced, uh, m many less borders and less intensified borders and more democratic control over what comes in and what comes out, specifically to protect people in the environment from predatory capitalist uh, companies. That's to me, the border should be used to keep those kinds of people out. Um, but, but, but more generally, the thing that I would say, like, I don't have a specific program, I have no idea how things will go. And it's not really up to me. Uh, who it's up to is very much important. And that is why I am hesitant to say, like, here's what we should do. And that's why I figure the migrant and theory of the border don't say at the end, like, and here's what we should do. Um, because the we there is very important. And the, those books are about who the we is. And if not everyone is included in coming up with the future, then who wants that kind of future? I mean, I don't want a future in which only some people are inquired to, philosophers or political theorists or politicians. No one group should be coming up with solutions. Um, and there shouldn't be, you know, there's, I read all the time, these kind of debates between liberal political theorists you know, should we have more open borders or should we not? Well, to me, the first question is, well, who is the we that's deciding that? And if that we is just citizens who can vote, then you're already, you're all, you're never going to get out of that problem. And you'll never, it's not yeah. truly a political conversation unless the people who are not included are included in that. And what that will look like, I don't know, because I cannot speak for those people and we shouldn't be speaking for groups like not including them and then speaking for them or assuming what they want in advance of their inclusion you know what i'm saying so part of the political project is just mm. a larger degree of inclusivity so that a desirable outcome can be had by everybody and i don't i i, I don't pretend to say what that is uh what, what that will be or what it should be for anybody else except that we all have to be part of that decision making process but I will say one more thing if it's, if that's, uh, you know, this is like not maybe a strongly normative position of this is the right thing to do. I don't care. It just is regardless of what anybody thinks that to me, mm -hmm. uh, that's a non-starter. Uh, I don't want to make, I don't want to have any normative theory like that. Um, but I would say that one of the consequences of taking seriously the figure of the migrant, um, if you look back and see that migrants are, are not just secondary or derivative historical figures and political figures that they're really primary they make up and circ their circulation their exploitation is what keeps states metastable states going it is their 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 lifeblood of circulation that keeps them going it keeps capitalism going without migration and human movement capitalism would really it would be at 
the whim of the workers who are moving um, if they refuse to move because capital is always moving and it needs all the migrants to follow. It needs the, the, the proletariat to be mobile. In any case, states, capitalism, they all require the mobility of this, mi- this migrant population. And even people who don't often consider themselves to be migrants, like commuters, um, don't think about themselves as mm-hmm. migrants. But there's a degree of you know relative migration that happens. I mean, we should be clear not to conflate these two, but there are definitely a range of degrees of mobility that capital and states require, and they would shut down without that. So anyway, the, the, the quasi-normative point here would be that if migration is primary and constitutive, then the people who are that population should be considered important, like constitutively important, and should not be deprived of voting rights and political status they should have status because they are socially, politically, economically constitutive actors in reproducing society. So anybody who is uh, contributing to society and who the decisions of that society are going to affect them, they should be included in in the decisions that affect them. Mm -hmm. So what do you think are some of the problems that we're seeing? Because I would argue that, you know, this this spatial container of the nation state that where migration really kind of where people were really kind of caged into their territories is perhaps around one or two centuries old. If I don't know if you necessarily agree with that or not, but what are the problems that we have once we start locking people into the territories in which they were born? What and we stop the movement from there? Um, I think that that's not even. I think it's never it's never been possible, and it won't be possible. And that you just can't stop. You cannot stop human movement. It's just not going to happen. It's like trying to stop air from circulating or viruses from circulating. Mm. You know, it's you can you can recirculate it you can move it around uh but you're not going to be able to stop it when it when it wants to move it is very 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 difficult to completely stop it now you can you can kill people for sure and the US Mexico border wall definitely kills thousands of people but you're not going to be able to stop uh human movement i mean i think you're right about at least with the rise of 18th and 19th century nationalism in increasingly container like model of of national identity has been a serious problem but it's mainly you know it's mainly ideological delusion it's never really been there's never really been some place where there was just one type of people that only spoke this one sort of language and had this one culture and i mean all of that stuff has never really been a full reality and the attempt to make it a reality has had incredibly bad consequences and so mm-hmm. yeah maybe i'm i'm i think it's very much very much a delusion that we could ever have that. So I think we should really just give up on that project of containers, national uh, states as being exclusive. Now, it's an open question of what an inclusive nationalism would look like. Uh, You know, to me, those words historically are very much at odds. But one, to me, one interesting example um, is Zapatismo. They're not exactly nationalist. But they have a very interesting form of identity, which is that they say that anyone can be Zapatista. And it means something different wherever you are. Um, You know, they say like, you know, be Zapatista and make Zapatismo wherever you're at. And historically, that's not a common political perspective shared by other indigenous groups for lots of reasons. But it's very much tied to Mm -hmm. an area of land, a place um, there's a history of hospitality and welcomeness, but there's also a history of um, blood markers and identification that have to do with racial, uh, ethnic, and blood purities that are not going to mm-hmm. yield uh, a necessarily universal political subject or project in the way that Zapatismo tries to have this very unstable universal in which somehow everybody can be that. If that anyway, so anyway, mm-hmm. it's an interesting and open question of what it would mean to have political identity that wasn't an exclusive one. Yeah, I, I think, I, at least for me, we it feels like we're socially very f- far from anything like yeah. that on a big scale. <laughs> you mentioned specifically viruses now. 
And you're saying that we cannot keep people contained, that people would just refuse to do that. So we're sitting right now in a situation where we have this global corona COVID-19 pandemic and in almost every country in the world that advises stay at home, don't go out, public gatherings, public facilities, schools are closed, don't move, at least for now. So, okay, <laughs> that's already the first conceit. It's not it's not supposed to be permanent but do you think with your perspective from the position of movement how how do you analyze our current uh the current mess that we're in the current situation that we're in right so i have a couple thoughts um one would be that what's happening is is i think it's again it's too simplistic and what we what what we miss if we just think everybody's immobile everybody's locked down that's the goal is to keep people not moving. I'm not sure if that actually is uh, the goal. And when we think about it that way, we leave out all this mobility that we're pretending like it's not there or we're not thinking about the mobility that is really happening uh, under conditions of quarantine or whatever. It reminds me of this great line that Foucault quotes, I forget by who, but some, you know, somebody in Discipline and Punish uh, talking about prisons where he says, you know, Prisons are just like society, but more so. I think that's a really good way of thinking about what's happening now under uh, the coronavirus is that it's just so far, I don't know if there's anything radically new that has emerged and it would be wonderful to see a different world come out on the other side of this pandemic. But I'm not really sure that I, we, I can speculate about what that is yet. Um, it'd be great if something new and better happened, but obviously something worse could happen too anyway. At the moment, it doesn't seem that anything new is really being radically opened up. But what to me is very obvious is that there's an amplification mm -hmm. and a clarity on so many issues that it can seem maybe not as important, but that really the pandemic highlights because societies become much more intense I am amplified so you can see all the little features of them that are going on. And I'm just going to say a couple of these features because they have to do with mobility. Um, one is that it's really, we often think about the world as being stable and then it's kind of disrupted every now and then by a pandemic or a climate crisis or, you know, some kind of, or a war or something like that. But it's really the other way around. And this is hope, I, I, this is one of the things that we should take from this is that no, the world really is, first of all, process and movement. And we're just kind of, we should be surprised the fact that it's as metastable as it is um, and that we can have stability for any period of time mm -hmm. is kind of incredible, uh, social or uh, ecological because of so, so many processes happening that really stability is the exception to the rule of process and not the other way around. So that's a thing to think about during this time. Another is that to me, this is really the whole pandemic has amplified uh, the point that it is really, really difficult um, to stop movement, to keep people from moving. And in some places, obviously, there's been more success than others, but you see what it takes in places like, you know, uh, India, where people are just being beaten in the street for being after curfew. You know, it's really, it's hard to keep, people are going to be sneaking out of their houses People are, there are people who are going to be homeless who don't have a place to be. When you try to actually stop, what's interesting is not that people are actually stopping movement, but what's interesting is what it takes. What are the conditions for the possibility of trying to keep circulation in a very, in as limited as possible, like just so that people can go to the grocery store and come back home? That's not, mm. not movement. That is a very, you know, constrained form of regional motion, but it has to be. Like, what does it take? Does it take the president to say it? Does it take the governor to say it? Do you take the police officers? But the point is, like, what does it take to make people not move is an interesting question. And the answer is, it takes a hell of a lot of mobility. It takes a lot of movement to keep people from, quote, not moving, which is to say incredible amounts of bandwidth of, you know, everybody in the world is on Zoom, <laughs> you know, right now. Uh, that is not, that's not immobility. That is an incredible, massive billion dollar industry that is just making a ton of money off of this and all of the industries that are profiting from the coronavirus we should think about those too as not stasis or immobility but as mm. moment inflection points where new regimes can be opened up and others uh, intensified so thinking about digital mobility it's real it's like 
you know, electromagnetic waves are real forms of mobility and they have real impacts on the environment, on, you know, corporate profits, on, you know, infrastructure, all, all kinds of things. Uh, so anyway, I think it's important to think about how hard it is and how absolutely impossible it is to keep everybody from moving. Because in principle, if everybody just stopped moving, stayed in their house for two weeks, you know, the, the virus, the whole thing could, but that's just not, that's not a possible solution. I think that's interesting that it's not that simple of just everybody go inside for two weeks and the virus will eventually run its course and we'll come all, we'll all come out at the same time. It's, you know, I think it shows and exposes how impossible it is to enforce uh, borders and barriers. That's not to say we should just give up on all forms of, you know, uh, social distancing or whatever. It's just to say that it's a very, it itself is a kind of circulation that people have to be kind of goaded into and they have to practice. It takes a discipline, it takes an architecture, it takes an infrastructure, it takes all these types of things. The other one is just how, the, another point to make here is just about how evident it is becoming, how um, kind of metastable and precarious uh, the whole global situation is, right? The world is so interconnected, but because it's so interconnected, it is so precarious and unstable. Um, and that's sort of related to the first point about thinking of process as being first. It's sort of incredible that the, that a kind of global world is able to be as stable as it is and not completely fall apart. But that that precarity is really built into the human body itself. And when we, you know, it's easy to forget possibly about that if we are connected to digital devices and not thinking about that. Um, everybody is uh, vulnerable, obviously, to different degrees. Uh, to, to the virus. The other one, I'll just say one last one. I have a couple more, but I'll just say one last one because I'm going on about coronavirus. It's been on our minds. So uh, no, please go uh, ahead. the last one is just, um, it's interesting to see, not surprising, of course, the beginning, an amplification of a tendency to blame uh, excessive mobility on certain populations. So for instance, xenophobia is the response to uncontrollable movement. And I'm thinking here specifically of Donald Trump's, you know, Chinese virus descriptions and kind of blaming other countries for the spread of the virus, the way in which, you know, border crossing is kind of vilified in the case of the virus. It's blamed on a group of people for transmitting it uh, is, again, not surprising, but it should be a very obvious amplification of the ways in which the fear of death, but also the kind of nationalist, very specific nationalist capitalist fear of leaky borders is quickly racialized and uh, may and used to kind of blame other people for uh, for that. But again, this is this is just part of the normal structure of of migration politics: is that the leaky borders are blamed on like infiltrators and you know, uh, migrants who are transmitting disease and bringing crime and whatever crazy things Trump says about, I mean, they're all false, but the key thing is, is that that falseness is that kind of racist narrative is built into the problem of borders. When they leak, there's a group like problems can be blamed on that leaky border and the people who are uh, causing that. So like border construction at the US-Mexico border is still going on right now, which is crazy because it's dangerous for all the workers um, but it's also crazy because, you know, but you see that that reaction, like Trump doesn't want to stop building the wall because it needs to be fortified in the name of defending the borders from viruses or whatever. But that's totally not how, you know, that's not how much of the viruses are being transmitted. It's not the fault of, you know, Mexican or Latin migrants coming over the border. Uh, that's not the bulk of why we're in the situation we're in. And yet that's the framing of the problem. So anyway, just an observation about migration and border politics in the time of COVID. Thank you for that. I'm also constantly looking in different directions to make sense of it. One direction is this kind of like Agamben state of exception direction to look in or, you know, Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, this kind of angle. But then also, you know, that's my skeptical side. But then when I'm in a slightly better mood, when the sun is shining, then I think maybe this can be the moment where people like start looking at the climate crisis in a different mm -hmm. way. Like we, we see that mass mobilization is possible. And we also see how precarious, as you said, how precarious the world system is. You know, maybe, just maybe this is the, the kind of wake up call that we need that actually something starts getting done about the climate crisis. But, you know, I'm 
those are in my small uh, optimistic moments, which is you know just a few <laughs> columns of light. I'm I, I'm with you. I'm 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 with you. I have those those same moments, and I think that it's very important and interesting to think about them too. And you know, I just read a um, the, an article by by Bifo Franco Berardi about uh, you know one of his hopes is that you know because people are pushed inside so much right now to, onto their you know into this virtual world, uh, you know um, that they will over over several months of quarantine they will kind of feel the real poverty of that digital world. And they will want to, as a result of that, you know, feel their kind of collective sociality and want to be, you know, to care more, uh, appreciate other people and to care about them more. I mean, maybe that will happen, you know, maybe that will happen. I, I, I hope that it does. I hope that something very positive comes out of this. Um, and that it becomes an opening uh, for something new to happen. But, you know, and I think it's definitely related to the, all of the kind of amplifications. It's like when a problem is amplified and pushed to a crisis, there's a chance that it could go a different way. Um, there's a chance that it could become much worse, but there's also a chance it could go a different way. And I think that's, you know, part of the sort of the shock doctor narrative, but it's also just part of the process of, you know, historical paradigms being pushed to their limit. And one of the things that pushes historical paradigms to their limits are wars, environmental crises, diseases, and things like that, where they amplify existing problems like healthcare in the United States. Mm. You know, it was always it was always a total mess, but now it's really a total mess to the point where you know single payer system looks uh, hopefully for many people like a better option. But that will remain to be seen. Uh, yeah, but anyway, Thomas, I think thank you so much. I think we covered a lot and it was really nice talking to you and your answers were Yeah, thanks for your great questions. It's yeah, it's been a pleasure. What is the next the next book or the next project that we can look forward to? Um so there's always you know, there's always a couple in the works. Um and it's hard to predict what will what will be published next given publication schedules. Um but I believe at this point the next book that will come out, so Lucre the second volume of the Lucretius book has just come out um this month. And in July, uh, there'll be a book coming out um, called Marx in Motion, A New Materialist Marxism uh, with, uh, with Oxford. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's the next thing that will, that will be out. Wow, that, I'm looking forward to that. That sounds very interesting. I was thinking of asking some questions on Marx, but I didn't. Uh... <laughs> Marx, is, Marx is one of those, for me, Marx is one of those philosophers who really, he does get the philosophy of motion. Uh, he get he, he understands it and he, he gets it right. And, um, but it does take a little bit of work to see exactly that he has a philosophy of movement, partially because uh, people usually don't read his dissertation. Uh, maybe one of the least read works of all of Marx's, but it's very important and it has lots of consequences for capital and the, and the economic works. So this book really tries to focus on that and read Marx in a non-anthropocentric way that is much more consistent with uh, uh, new materialism than many Marxists and new materialists think. Uh, mm. Right now, they're definite, those two groups are at odds with each other. And this is the first book um, on the topic of new materialism and Marxism. And so uh, I'm interested to see, but I'm very much prepared that uh, Marxists and new materialists will hate it for different reasons. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably how it usually goes, right? Uh, <laughs> But uh, I do think it's important for those groups to get together because new materialism without Marx, to me, is is not does not have a future. And Marxism, and I think Marx was already doing new materialism, but you know, I I think it's important that reading that dissertation really brings it out in a way that I think a lot of Marxists have other places, Grunrys and so on that they that they cite and go to. But I think the dissertation is really where Marx makes his case the clearest about the importance and his definition of matter and materiality. Thank you very much, Professor Nail, and uh, please come back Thank you. for a follow-up episode anytime you want. Absolutely. Thank you.